You know, it's, uh, it's interesting. I was thinking last night, this is, we're, we're sitting here, and this is the day that we all knew was going to come, but yet we also thought it would never come, which is the day that we're seriously talking about the political unraveling of America. So the question is whether that's a happy or unhappy day. I think that determines on, d- depends on whether you think there's some kind of deterministic arc to human history. Uh, I personally think it's a happy day. And I think it's something that we should be celebrating and thinking about and pushing forward because it's not really just about us, is it? It's about our kids and grandkids more than anything. So I'm just curious how many of you saw the uh, brouhaha which happened with R- Rand Paul the other night as he was leaving the, uh, the uh, Republican convention. And uh, I was really struck by some of the coverage of that event. And of course, Rand and his wife Kelly went on TV a couple times to discuss it. And as I was watching that, and I was seeing some of the usual suspects come out from underneath rocks and say, oh, they weren't attacked. That wasn't threatening. Politicians deserve to be yelled at. The very fact that he was at a Trump rally means that he deserves it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It, it, what, what I thought was, you know, not only is this not a nation anymore, it's not even much of a country at this point. A friend of mine, Alana Mercer, I wouldn't go this far personally, but she, she calls America Walmart with nukes. <laughs> and that's what it kind of feels like, doesn't it? it? It feels like we live in a transactional country where the only commonality we have is, is basically material. And, and I'm not downplaying that. That's a lot. Uh, material is a lot. We're, we're very, very blessed to live in a country with, the, with this kind of material wealth. But I, it feels to me like we have lost sight, when you look at this incident with Rand Paul, of who are the imposers and who are the imposed upon. It seems like that's gotten very, very murky, because the people who are attacking him and those police officers, they, they feel like they are the imposed upon, Right? The people who are burning and looting and rioting in cities like Portland, Chicago, they feel like the impo- they, they are the imposed upon, not the imposers. I, of course, I think that's wrong. I think that's the opposite. But what's the, the important point here is that both sides think that. For example, Christian America very much feels like the secular world is imposing on it and that it is acting in self-defense, let's say, by voting for Donald Trump or whomever. So this is a very strong uh, thread that runs through the American psyche right now, this sort of victim-oppressor narrative. It's not very healthy. So the problem, one problem, with the left is that everything that happens, uh, everything in human society now has to be viewed through this lens of critical theory. Now, that doesn't mean that your average Joe Biden voter has thought much about this or cares much about this, but, but at that really hardcore part of the left, this is the animating spirit, which is that we have to view today's events through this lens of presentism. Uh, everything has to be designed. Uh, everything has to be thought of in terms of identity. And of course, what this does is the opposite of what economics does, what markets do, which is it inhibits social cohesion. The whole point of a society, of a culture, is to have some social cohesion. And, and it appears that the, in, the entirety of politics right now is aimed at disrupting that. I think a lot of you recall Steve Bannon, who recently had some legal troubles. He was one of the architects of Trump's successful 2016 campaign. Well, way back in, in January of 2020, when the only thing dividing the country was Trump in those, those idyllic days when we didn't have uh, riots and COVID, he was on this PBS show, the documentary called Divided America. They interviewed a lot of other people as well. And one of the things he mentioned is that we're, we live in what he calls post-persuasion America, which means we all have these little cell phones in our pockets, and, and even though we can access all the information in the world, all of, all of history, uh, in fact, we're sort of more dug in than ever before with respect to our personal worldviews. And so you'd think that a time of, of unlimited, virtually free access to information would make us sort of more open-minded or searching or, or critical of our own perspectives, perhaps, but it's, he says it's done the opposite. Maybe that's true, I don't know. But his point is that if we're in post-persuasion America, what matters is not trying to win people over intellectually or, or via debate or something like that. What, what matters is mobilization. 
And of course, he was using that term in the sense of the 2016 and now upcoming 2020 election that the side, I guess, is, that's going to win is the side which mobilizes best. But since then, since January, things have changed in this country. We might think of mobilization more of something as who mobilizes in the streets. And that's what's really happening in our country. So this doesn't bring me any pleasure, don't get me wrong. I, I know, like a lot of you, I love America. I care about this country very much. I feel very blessed to have been born here. And, you know, one of the great sources of wealth in this country is just its vast landscape. I mean, if you think of the diversity between some places like, you know, Honolulu is a bunch of lava rocks and then Des Moines and then Alaska and then Miami and New York City. I mean, this is an incredibly vast country. And that vastness might come in handy uh, because it looks like we're all fixing to spread out a little bit here as people start to flee cities. But the problem with this vastness is that we have a, a vast population too. We have 330 million odd people who are all being governed mostly by Washington, D.C. And not only just by a few thousand people in Washington, D.C. or even a few hundred uh, members of the so-called legislature, but more and more they're being governed by five or six Supreme Court justices. And that, more than anything, is a recipe for anything but social cohesion. So we've always had this, this sense that America needs 50 states and you know, manifest destiny, Americans, America goes west, and we, at some point we needed Hawaii so we could refuel our, uh, our airplanes, and at some point we bought Alaska from the Tsar in Russia because we thought we were going to have gold and furs up there. But, but it, it's really become something that's fixed in the American psyche, and I think it's time that it becomes unfixed. Because at this point, our size, our vastness has become our Achilles heel. This country is becoming ungovernable. And if you look at happy countries, at countries that do have a degree of social cohesion, they tend to be smaller. And no one knows what that optimal number is, but uh, we do know that 330 million doesn't look like it. And, and I would add that what we should care about is, the, is per capita wealth in the United States, not GDP, not some number about big you know, size or who's got the biggest GDP or something. That's why you would rather live in Liechtenstein than India, right? India's got a lot bigger GDP than Liechtenstein, but it's per capita that matters. So as we look at this unraveling of our country, I think it's time that we honestly assess it. You know, who, who are we? What is America? And what do we want? Because Tom Woods points out that Political arrangements exist to serve us, not the other way around. We can pick and choose. This isn't written in stone. So how, how might this happen? Well, I've got some good news. It's happening already. Really, the decentralizing impulse in the midst of an otherwise rotten 2020 is the most important trend of the 21st century, and it's accelerating every day. It's decentralizing impulse away from the sclerotic you know, the vertical top-down organizations like federal government would be a good example of that, and towards interconnected networks with no central hub. And we have seen this unbelievably with respect to the response to COVID. This has been just a, an unbelievable example, not only of federalism within the United States, but even on an international scale. I mean, all of the centralizing bodies it, it, on our planet, the, the UN, the CDC, the WHO have been proven absolutely useless. Nobody's listening to them. They give us conflicting information about asymptomatic spread, about masks, you know, lockdown, don't lock down, go outside, don't go outside. And so they're losing credibility. And as a result of this, individual nation states have reasserted themselves and, and they've all gone in their own directions. The, uh, the vaunted Schengen Area Agreement in Europe even broke down. And, and now, uh, or, or at least right, right as COVID began to become known, you know, a Frenchman couldn't just drive into Germany anymore. I mean, that's how little accord people really give to international agreements and, and bodies when things get a little ugly. It turns out that all crises are local. So not only have we seen within Europe different responses to COVID, but, but we've seen 
in, incredible differences worldwide. You know, you had very authoritarian approaches in, in the Wuhan district of China, where, where we continue to see a very authoritarian approach in, in uh, the Victoria state of Australia. And then you've had other countries like Sweden and Belarus that have pretty much done nothing about it. They, they pretty much stayed open, just you know, done some minor precautions with wash your hands, use a sanitizer, et cetera. So you've got a tremendous amount of diversity there, which I think bodes very well for a decentralist future. Within the United States, of course, we've had all kinds of examples. We have Governor Kristi Noem out in South Dakota uh, having TV ads where she says, we're open for business, relocate here. Um, you know, they had the recent uh, Sturgis motorcycle rally. And then you have other states, uh, New York and New Jersey, the city of San Francisco, for example, has been very heavily locked down. And then uh, even, even when you go a level below the governmental level, if you look at uh, college football, this is an absolutely fascinating example of how the NCAA, the putative boss of college athletics, has no authority. Uh, not only have different conferences started to disagree and break up over how, whether they're going to play football and uh, against whom they'll play, but even within the conferences, uh, individual schools that have power, like Ohio State, is saying, well, I, well you know, we don't know if we're going to abide by the Big Ten's decision. So that strikes me as, as, as really, really interesting, that's, that a cultural component of America, a strong cultural component, especially in the South, college football, could actually be helping to lead the way in this decentralist revolution. So uh, after COVID, a, another really heartening trend that we see is this great relocation that's happening. I mean, this is really a de facto form of secession and it's taking place right in front of us because people are moving away from big cities like New York and San Francisco and Los Angeles and Chicago in numbers that were already happening but have been accelerated by the COVID crisis. And you know, it wasn't that long ago that they were telling us, oh, these people under 40, they all wanna live in big cities. You know, the, the, the country's dead, even the suburbs are dead. There was a 2019 study in something called the Journal of Regional Science that studied the net migration of younger people under 40 from about 1980 to about 2010. And they said, you know, these young people today, they're changing, they, they, they don't care about having a big house in the suburbs, they're getting married later, if at all. They're having fewer kids, if any. They don't really want a car and all the trappings of adulthood, and they might be perfectly happy living in, in a hip city well into their 30s or even 40s with roommates. And this is a fundamental change in how we do business in America. Um, and so in the 80s and 90s, the, the trend was for young people to go to New York and San Francisco, and then in the 2000s, they discovered Washington, D.C., and Miami, and some other cities. And so we were told that this is the new trend, and, and within just a year now, we're being told the exact opposite, that all of a sudden young people uh, are realizing that cities don't offer much opportunity anymore, that they're full of crime, that uh, their uh, rent and housing is way too expensive. And furthermore, now we, we all find out that we can work from home and that we can telework. Maybe you don't have to live in, with three roommates in Park Slope anymore. So this has been a boon, of course, or will be a boon for so-called second tier cities, places like Columbus, Ohio, or, or Charlotte, or Tampa, or maybe Orlando. And so that's gonna be very interesting to see because we already had an aging population in this country that was sort of headed out of the Northeast uh, towards the Sun Belt states or the Southeastern states, just because as you get older, you tend to want to have lower property taxes, which is mostly true in the South. You also tend to want to get away from snow and cold. So now we have sort of a, a, a twin axis where both older and younger people are moving away from cities into suburbs and then beyond suburbs to what we might call exurbs like Orlando, and I think that this will have a decentralizing influence on political power. Because you look at New York State, it's dominated by Manhattan politically. And so all the upstate people in New York really resent that they can't get anything done you know, politically. Uh, Atlanta dominates Georgia. Nashville increasingly dominates Tennessee. You, but, but as people spread out more, a lot of that political power is dissipated with them. And, and so they're out in cities, or they're out in suburbs, they're out in exurbs. And I think that the, uh, the chokehold that urban America has had on the political landscape may be lessening as a result. So maybe the happiest decentralist revolution that's happening in front of us is of course in education, which is 
crumbling with rapidity, I think that is pretty astonishing to most of us. Um, in just my own personal circumstances, I would say in the last three to five years, my own considerations of what my teenage children might do in the future, it has changed completely from sort of a, well, sure, they'll go to college, but you know, maybe not some expensive grad school or something to maybe they won't go to college. And that's fascinating if you think about it, because what colleges want to do is exactly the opposite of what they ought to do. They no longer want to teach a real classical liberal education, which is the one thing you ought to be getting when you're young and you have some time to study classics and history and literature and philosophy. So they don't do that anymore. They teach gender studies and wokeism and uh, how to borrow money and how to hate your parents' guts. But the flip side is they do a really bad job of technical training. You go to four years of undergrad, you, you, know, you still don't know anything about being a nurse or a doctor or an automobile technician or an HVAC person or electrician or anything else. So, you know, as it turns out that both technical training, other than perhaps maybe engineering, law, medicine, can be done at, the, at a technical school level or an online level, but also that classical liberal education, which I think people ought to have, is something you not only can, but, but now you really have to obtain on your own. You can go read uh, Moby Dick without a, a $180,000 college professor, it turns out. So what I think is happening, though, over the past couple of months is the, the, the teachers unions have had a meltdown, and the American people and American parents are starting to call their bluff. And they're saying, what do we need these guys for? If we're going to be online, why can't we just have the best social studies teacher in the country teaching every kid? Why do we have to have the, the crappy one at the middle school where I live? <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question, isn't it? And so what, what fascinates me, though, about this homeschool revolution is it used to be viewed as something that was kind of uh, crankish, that it, it, oftentimes uh, people on the left viewed homeschoolers as religious types, people who wanted to have their kids removed from society, uh, people who were raising sort of cultish kids, and of course, worryingly to the left, people who were withdrawing their kids from the sort of left social indoctrination that they think every child needs to have. But now because of COVID for the first time, we're seeing a lot more sort of mainstream and left-wing people keep their kids home. And that is a development that I think bodes very, very well for our movement because I mean, once you realize you can keep your kid home, and once you start to see that flexibility, and once you start to think about the possibilities, I think that could be a sea change. So this isn't just something that's, uh, you know, some, some uh, Mormons in Utah or some Baptists down in Alabama doing anymore. This is something that's going to come into the mainstream. And, and I think it's also go going to dawn on people that education ought to be delivered more like a marketplace good or service. In other words, there ought to be some a la carte options. There ought to be some accountability. There ought to be some price competition. There ought to be some, some merit to the instructor. Uh, and that's, this, this is going to be a very, very interesting development. And, and the final, I think, decentralist message that's happening is just the state and its financial situation. I mean, the idea that, the, that Uncle Sam is going to be able to continue to do what he does, um, much, you know, re remake Afghanistan in the image of Thomas Jefferson, uh, you know, m much less fixed potholes on Interstate 10 it is very much in question. It, it is. I mean, just six months ago or 12 months ago, it almost seems quaint. We were just fretting about $22 trillion in debt or a $200 trillion fiscal gap between future entitlement promises we've made and as an actuarial matter, the likely value of future tax receipts, $200 trillion gap, okay, which basically means the baby boomers are the last generation to get Social Security and Medicare. So those were the quaint problems we had six or nine months ago. Add to that now what both Congress and the Fed have done. I mean, the Fed's balance sheet has gone from, a, from about $4 trillion to over seven. And I don't know if you saw Jerome Powell's uh, speech the other day in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, but he basically acknowledged that inflation is going to be a thing because they've been doing their damnedest to tell us it's not a thing for the last 20 years. And apparently economists don't go to the grocery store. They don't uh, pay copays at the doctor. 
They, you know, I don't know who these guys are. But basically, Jerome Powell said something pretty profound, and the, the profundity is always buried in the details, isn't it? But they have this 2% inflation mandate, which is, of course, crazy, be, because inflation is a process by which we all get poorer, whether it's 1% or 2%, you know, or 20%. Uh, but nonetheless, they, they target 2% inflation in the economy. That would be quite a trick if you could do that, wouldn't it? But now he says, well, you know, instead of targeting this, we're going to let inflation go a little hotter, which is, which is basically his way of acknowledging that the new money creation on the fiscal side by Congress and on the monetary side by the Fed is going to cause some, some pain and some price inflation. But instead of going for 2%, we're going to let it kind of go like this. Remember those, uh, in, in math, those, those sine waves where you had kind of a line through the middle, but the wave was going like this? And so, you know, we're just going to try to aim it for 2%. Let 2% be the line, but sometimes it can go up to 4 And it's been zero for so long that it's okay if it's 4 for a while, because that'll average out to 2 Okay. I mean, th wh what this is is basically an acknowledgement, okay, that the, 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 the people in charge don't know what they're doing any more than we do. Okay, we're on our own here. And that's, that's, that's a beautiful thing. If, if we allow it to be so. So for the first time in US history, for the fiscal year 2020, which ends October 1st, calendar, fiscal year versus calendar year, for the first time, we're gonna have a federal deficit, a single year deficit that is as large or perhaps even exceeds tax revenues for the year. So the, the, the budget that Congress passed, nobody ever follows a budget that they pass. I mean, it's just a meaningless document. But the budget that Congress passed for 2020 was supposed to spend about $4.8 trillion. And the projection was that we would bring in about $3.7 trillion. Well, as it turns out, uh, with the, the CARES Act, uh, with, with all the federal unemployment benefits that are being paid, that are being paid, uh, with potentially another round of federal unemployment benefits, with, which Trump wants to do, of course, to improve his own election chances, we're, uh, you know, the federal government's going to spend something more like seven trillion this year, maybe eight, and they're going to bring in maybe four. So what you have is a situation where literally half of the federal government's operations for the year are funded by debt. And of course, the MMTers, for those of you who have been following monet modern monetary theory, say this is A-OK. -okay. This is not only A-OK, -okay, it could be 100%. And it can be for a while. I, I mean, there's some truth to that. The MMTers would go at it a little bit differently uh, than how the Fed goes, goes at it. But if, if we can do 50%, why not 80%? Why not 90 And when you get into 80 or 90 you know, we start to look more like Switzerland where taxes are flipped, right? In, in Switzerland, very little is done at the federal level, constitutionally, and, and, and political matters are pushed down to the cantons, the 26 cantons, which, is, which are the states in Switzerland, or to the communes, which are the cities in Switzerland. So if you're Swiss, you pay about 80% of your tax bill to your city or state, and only about 20% to the feds. That's flipped in the United States, isn't it? Well, that's, that's interesting, though, if we start to look at how the, the, the federal government ostensibly finances its operations. This, this, we could reach a point very quickly where people across this country and, and governments across this country simply stop submitting federal tax receipts. I mean, at what point do you say it's all funny money and smoke and mirrors? At what point does a Christy Nome say, you know, we're going we're gonna to finance this road ourselves. It's a very interesting experiment, and I don't think we've ever been in this kind of situation before, because you know that these states and these governors are expecting a bailout. I, I mean, if you look at your town, uh, somebody has to mow that grass by the side of the highway. Somebody has to pay the police. Uh, you know, somebody has to perform basic functions. We're not talking about new projects for which your city might float a bond. We're, we're t you, don't, you don't issue bonds for basic maintenance and operations of your city. Um, you know, and, and the ability of cities and states to borrow money is very constrained. Do you want to buy muni bonds right now from uh, Kenosha? <laughs> I don't. So, so they're looking for a bailout from the federal government. And when you, when you think about what probably second and third, especially third quarter tax receipts are going to look like for these states and cities, with all the restaurants closed, all the retail dead in the water, 
Uh, so many people staying home. Nobody's buying gas, hardly to drive. No one's going out to eat. No one's traveling. No one's going to hotels. Uh, I mean, they, they're, they're going to want a bailout from the federal government. So this is the, the idea that the federal government is going to constrain itself in the next couple of years is, is, is absolutely not happening. And, and I think Jerome Powell, in so many words, admitted that on his end the other day. So this, this unraveling, this decentralist impulse, uh, perhaps more than anything, is going to occur simply because the federal government's not going to be able to pay the bills anymore. And we're going to be re forced to come up with a new way. So I guess the question is, is um, can all this happen peacefully? Well, that, that's a very good question. I mean, it feels like a, a simmering cold civil war in the United States is breaking out into a hot civil war. That's what we've, we're seeing on, on the streets of some cities. The problem, of course, is that we have 24-7 media today. We have social media as well on top of that. So that could give us a false perception uh, as we consume content of, of really how much unrest is out there. Things might be a lot more peaceable than we think. M most people might be a lot more reasonable than we think. In other words, the people who show up the loudest on cable networks and on social media may, might be that 10% who are sort of hyper-partisan, uh, angry, aggressive, opinionated, and that there's actually this sort of complacent uh, majority in America that doesn't want all this unrest. And I think that's probably true to an extent. The, 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 no, the percentage of Americans who are going to be over 65 is set to double over the next 30 years. So, you know, civil wars are usually fought by younger, angrier countries. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's a fact that might bode against a hot civil war, and we certainly hope it does. I mean, we want, we, we want this to be peaceable. Uh, but when the federal government can, can no longer provide Social Security or Medicare or highways or defense, you know, all these things that it does, I think that's, that's going to be the pain threshold we have to reach to, to really get there and start breaking up. And, of course, the difficulty in doing so is that we don't have clear geographic lines. Every state is a mix of what we might call deplorables and, and wokers, right? I mean, if, if, if you look at California, people think of it as a deep blue state, but it's not a deep blue state. The coastal California is deep blue. You go 20 miles inland, anywhere in California, and it's country music and Mexican rancheros, and, and, and you can say the same about Portland and Seattle. Um, the state where I happen to live, Alabama, it, people think of that as some deep red state. You know, there weren't really any Trump signs in, in 2016. I think Alabamans would have probably preferred to vote for a Mike Huckabee or a Ted Cruz or something. I saw far, far more Trump signs in Pennsylvania, places like that, the Rust Belt when I was up there. But nonetheless, Alabama has some very blue cities. It has Birmingham and Montgomery, which are historic black cities. Uh, and so any kind of geographic or physical separation along those lines would, would presumably leave a lot of those blue, blue voters uh, feeling disenfranchised. And, and this, is, this is something that's inherent in any sort of political or geographic breakup. It's inescapable. There's the idea of the rump state, which is the old uh, uh, government or state left behind, and then the, the new state. Um, it, it's, it's a difficult problem, and, and I, don't, I don't have any easy answers other than to say... It might happen just because we we start shrugging. It, it might not require some big violent upheaval or some constitutional process or some big declaration by the red states. It might just occur uh, in in a because we just start to say no. There's a, a fascinating article by Angelo Cotavilla. He's a retired professor at, at uh, Boston New or Boston College. I can't remember, but. Um, but he, he wrote an article called The Cold Civil War in the Claremont Review of Books. And that's, they have a paywall, but that particular article is available for free, The Cold Civil War. And he, he talks about in that article very fairly to both sides, by the way. And, and of course, we would argue that there's not two sides. But, but for, you know, we, we understand the rubric he's using is that people could just simply stop complying with federal edicts. It's not that hard to imagine. There's something like three million federal employees in total. So he describes a situation where uh, you know, schools in some southern state just start having prayer again um, at school. Are the, the, fed, what, are the federales going to send in troops? 
Uh, it seems unlikely. And he talks about the same thing happening in a blue state with respect to immigration or, or whatever it might be. So there's always winners and losers. It, it's, it's just the nature of things. And I think we tend to focus on maybe some sort of deterministic or even utopian uh, plan or approach. And if we look at human history, that's not generally how things unravel. And of course, oftentimes they unravel slowly. All of this might happen well beyond our lifetimes. But I think we still have an opportunity because of what's happening and also an obligation to do our parts to, to move this unraveling along because there, there's a price for all this. There, there's a price to peace and there's going to be a price paid for peace in America. And are we willing to pay it? And that price is, increasingly, we have to reject political universalism. This idea that we, we have to convince 51% of the electorate to see the world our way, and we need to gather them up, and we need to win some big national election, and then we need to use our newfound political power to vanquish the other side. Because, you know, let's be honest, the, the left would vanquish us. And whether that would mean politically or worse, they would. Okay, there's, there's plenty of people in this country who think it's A-OK -okay to break a few eggs to make an omelet. And, and I think they're, they're showing us who they are right now. And I think we should believe them when they show us who we are. Uh, but nonetheless, the answer to that, the response to that, I think, is not to try to vanquish them politically. It's some sort of tit-for-tat game. It's to show the strength and the courage to say that we're not going to accept this and we're going to go our own way, however that might look. So this is, this is the price that people don't want to pay, the idea that as much as we disagree with what other people do or another country does or another political subdivision does, that we have to let them do it, it is somehow exceedingly difficult for human beings, but it is the next evolution if we're going to evolve as a species from, from kings and outright subjugation and serfs uh, to monarchs to so-called democracy and now, unfortunately, to social democracy. The next evolution, I think, is decentralist and it's far more about the, the level at which you're governed than necessarily the ideology uh, by which you're governed. So. What I would say to you in closing is that, you know, any problems that we have, any difficulties that we face as a result of this political situation with, we're in is really nothing compared to what previous generations of Americans went through. Uh, this is not about us. It's about our kids and our grandkids. And I think we should be clear eyed and honest about the state of America. And, and let's get moving with this unraveling. Thank you very much. So...